Let's turn in the Word of God this time to Mark chapter 11. Mark is, is only 16 chapters long, and Mark chapter 11 is, is describing Palm Sunday. If, if today was Palm Sunday, the, 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 the day of Jesus' triumphal entry, then, then Friday is when he is crucified. So chapters 11 through 16, about 40% of the book of Mark describes the last week of Jesus' life on this earth. And because today is Palm Sunday, we're reading from two Gospels about the triumphal entry. Mark chapter 11, 1 to 11 is our first reading. This is the Word of God. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and we'll send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing, untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem, went into the temple. When he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now we turn to John chapter 12. And we'll read verses 12 to 19. John 12. Verse 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, so they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that, the, you, see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. That's far the reading of God's holy word. We turn now to the text for this morning's sermon, which is Mark chapter 15, verses 1 through to 32. And I won't be going through the text verse by verse as I usually do, but I'll be focusing on those verses where the phrase King of the Jews is written. So it's about six times in this reading. And so as we're reading, just pay attention to when we see that phrase, King of the Jews. That will be the focus of the sermon. So let's read Mark chapter 15, 1 through to 32. This is the holy word of God. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, are you the King of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. The crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? 
And they cried out again, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? For they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him, and they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled the passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And thus far, the reading of God's holy word and the text for this morning's sermon. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, in 2019, a massive billboard appeared in Times Square in New York with the words, Jesus is King. It was an advertisement for Kanye West's new album with the same title. And upon the release of that album, Google reported a spike in searches of the Bible all around the world as hundreds of thousands, even millions of people looked up in the scriptures some of the the lyrics from this album. A massive billboard and one of the most powerful and wealthy cities in the world, Jesus is king. If your life was a billboard, what would it say? Does your life say that? Christ is king? You know, on Palm Sunday, that's certainly what the crowds thought and said. Palm Sunday is... Today, it is the Sunday before Good Friday. If we were back in the time of the Lord Jesus walking on the earth, and if we're in the last week of his life, then last night would have been that dinner at the house of Simon the leper when Jesus was anointed by Mary for his burial. And the next day on the Sunday, there was the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. When the crowds cried, as we read in John chapter 12, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And what they're doing is they're just quoting Psalm 118, which we've been singing through in this service. Christ rides into Jerusalem as a king through the eastern gate. He's coming from the direction of the Mount of Olives. There's, There's Bethany over here. Then there's the Mount of Olives, there's the Garden of Gethsemane on the western slope, and then there's the eastern gate of Jerusalem, and then there's the temple. So he's, he's coming in from the east as a king. And the crowds receive him as a king. They adore him as a king and as a Messiah. The expectation of the Jews, even till today, is that the Messiah will come through the eastern gate of Jerusalem which if you look 
in Google Street View is blocked up today. It has been blocked up for centuries because he has already come in through that gate. So there's Jesus coming into Jerusalem, the triumphal kingly royal entry on the Sunday. Four days later on Thursday night, he is dragged basically upon, along that same route from the Garden of Gethsemane at the foot of Mount Olives into the city as a criminal. In just four days' time, everything changes. And without, within hours of his arrest, the crowd who was crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel, the royal son of David. A few days later, five days later, they're screaming, crucify him. Why? Why are they crying out, crucify him? Well, the astonishing thing is, is that they're calling out for his crucifixion because he has said that he is the king. If you look at the end of Mark chapter 14, when Jesus is beyond before the Sanhedrin, and they can't find any crime to stick on him, and they finally ask him if he is the son of the blessed, the son of God, the Messiah. And Jesus says, that's who I am. I am the Messiah. I am the king of heaven and earth, and you will see me coming up on the clouds of heaven. And the response of the leaders of God's people, the response of the church is death. You need to die. You would call yourself our king, we will kill you. So I, what I want to do this morning as we go through this chapter 15, the part that we read, is to focus specifically on those verses where that phrase, king of the Jews or king of Israel, comes back. And so we see it first there in the accusation which they bring against him to Pilate. That's in verse 2. And Pilate asks, are you the king of the Jews? The reason he asks that it's because that's what the leaders of God's people said. If you look at Luke chapter 23, they specifically said that this man, he's a troublemaker, he's an agitator, he tells people not to pay taxes to Caesar, which was a lie, and he calls himself a Christ king, an anointed king, a Messiah king. This is the leaders of God's people trying to get Jesus in trouble with the civil authorities, with the Romans. And that was very well calculated, these accusations they brought against him, because it was Passover. And Passover is a celebration of liberation. Passover remembers that God's people were slaves in Egypt and that they were brought out by God's mighty hand into freedom. They were saved from oppression and subjugation to a foreign power. And of course, the Romans didn't really like Passover, did they? Because they were a foreign power and they were subjugating the Jews. And so it was always a little awkward around Passover. They had all their spies and all their soldiers and policing um, abilities on high alert for anybody that would, at the time of the Passover, have any ideas about replicating what happened many years ago in Egypt and leading the people out from subjugation. So when they accuse Jesus of being an agitator and against the authorities and calling himself an anointed king, this is calculated to get Pilate really, really involved here. Now Pilate, he was a bloodthirsty man. He was quick to shed blood and he did a lot of cruel things when he was ruling there in Judea. But he's not too worried when he looks at the man standing in front of him. You don't see Pilate's kind of dealing with Jesus as a major political threat. What he does is he flips this around. You're saying this man is, is a Messiah king, an anointed king. Well, are you? Are you the king of the Jews? This weak, pathetic, humble figure in front of me, are you the leader of this weak, pathetic subjugated people. And so what Pilate is doing as we look at verse 2, he is mocking, mocking Jesus, mocking the people of God. And then we move on to, to verse 9 where the, the phrase comes in again, where he, he says, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? Here, that phrase is used not as an accusation, but as an offer. Do you want this man as your king? Why does he ask that? Well, look at verse 10. He perceived that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. And you remember when we read about 
Palm Sunday, we, we read John chapter 12, and you remember the reaction of the leaders of God's people. Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. Everybody was talking about it. Then everybody's shouting out that he's the royal son of David. He's the Messiah. He's brought into Jerusalem as a king. And the leaders of God's people are just beside themselves with envy. Everybody's going after him, and nobody's paying any attention to us. And so even before they have any crime to accuse him of, they decide to kill him. Because the greatest crime for the Pharisee, the legalist, and the false believer is the crime of putting them down and putting God up. And so he offers to them Jesus as the king of the Jews. Jesus has said that to them before the Sanhedrin. He has told them, I am the Christ. I am the Son of God. I am the Son of Man from Daniel's prophecy, given divine power and glory at the right hand of God. You will see, see me seated on the throne of the universe. And that is, you, at the end of Mark 14 there, you see that's what drives them crazy. When Jesus asserts his lordship over them, they want to kill him. They will not accept it. Christ says, I am king, and instead of worshiping, they decide to murder him. And it drives that hatred for Christ's lordship and kingship drives them so much that they choose a murderer and a terrorist, Barabbas, rather than Jesus. That's the lengths to which sinners go to avoid bowing the knee, to avoid submitting to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Nothing has changed in all the history of the world since the fall. The length to which we sinners will go, embracing the most vile and wicked things and people in order to avoid bowing the knee to Jesus and submitting to him as our king. So there's the accusation in verse 2, the offer in verse 9, and then a decision in verse 12, because here it comes again, Pilate again said to them, what then shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? In all of this so-called trial here, Pilate is kind of confused. He's not showing any leadership. Multiple times he declares that Jesus is innocent, but he, he lets himself be pushed along by the will of the mob. What shall I do with him? What is to be done with Christ the king? And the mob says, crucify him. And Pilate says, why? And their reason is this, because his kingship is offensive. The sovereign lordship of Jesus is an offense to every sinner who loves their sin. And it's so offensive that the sinner will agitate for the torture and the murder of the Lord of glory, the Lord of life. They will embrace shame and false witness and injustice and murder and death. They will embrace anything vile, anything, just to get out of having to bow the knee to Christ the King. So here in verse 12, the world is asking the church, do you want Jesus as your king? What shall we do with the Christ, says the world to the church? And when the world asks that question, what shall we do with the Christ? Then so-called Christians who are ashamed of him stay silent. Or worse, they engage in pathetic attempts to avoid the ridicule of the world by despising and ridiculing, rid, ridiculing divine truth together with the world. You see, both the world and the false church and false belief will not accept Christ the King on his terms. And so they refuse him. He's offered they refuse him. And then we go to verse 17 where we see that this term is used in, in mockery. They begin to salute him. They, they made a crown of thorns. They clothed him in purple cloak. That's the color of royalty and, and, and power. And they begin to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews, as they strike him and spit on him and mock him, pretending to honor him. Well, that's not a surprise, is it? If the church herself despises her Lord and 
rejects him, the world is, of course, even more happy to do so. This is not simply a mockery of Jesus as a person, but as they mock the Lord. Pilate and his soldiers are mocking God. They are mocking God's plan of salvation. They are mocking God's people, the people of God, Israel. They are mocking all of redemptive history. They are mocking the grace and the glory of God and providing a savior for his people. They're saying this stupid idea that you have that some Messiah is going to come and save you is just that. It's stupid. You're a bunch of fools. Look at this man. He's pathetic. He's a loser. We spit on him. Your savior and your hopes for salvation are ridiculous. Well, nothing changes because the world does the same thing today. Today, people still describe Christianity in the most absurd terms. The world is more than happy to ridicule your faith and to mock your Lord. And then we have not just the mockery, but there in verse 26, we have the charge. In verse 26, he is on the cross. The inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. The king of the Jews. Jesus is judged. He is condemned. He is crucified for the crime of being king. For the crime of being who he is. And here we have Rome, the world empire, in the name of the entire human race, saying, we despise the Christ. The Christ is weak and despicable. God's people are weak and pathetic. And their greatest savior, their greatest hope, their greatest king, their Lord, is weak and pathetic. Look at him bleeding out here on the cross. This is the best you can come up with. A weak humiliated, bleeding, suffering Savior. What a disaster. What a pathetic sight. We condemn him. The kingdom and the power and the glory of man will crush this crucified Christ like a flea. So that high and exalted title, King of the Jews, is used to mock and ridicule and despise the Lord of glory. Nothing's changed. The world still does that. As Jesus' name is used in a, as a cuss word, as an exclamation often combined with foul language. And isn't it astonishing that we, the children of God, and man, I include myself in this, brothers and sisters, it's so hard, isn't it? You really want to watch a movie, you want to watch a a TV series, which is really, really good, but it's got a whole bunch of blasphemy in it, and you kind of justify it to yourself. You know, while Jesus is being blasphemed and his name is being combined with foul, vile, dirty words, and you think, well, yeah, but it's, it's still a good movie. We kind of convince ourselves that that's a, a reasonable cost to pay for being entertained. The world hasn't changed the glorious name of Christ is used to despise him. Satan delights in that. Satan likes it when the way things are made to be are twisted so that they are the way they ought not to be. He delights in the use of the name that is above every other name to turn glory into shame. So there's that charge. And then finally, the challenge in verse 32. Verse 32 The challenge, not just the world mocking Jesus and making fun of his exalted status, as this is great big contrast between the title on the the cross and, and the bleeding figure beneath it. But the church joins in. God's people join in. They sit there around the cross and they say, Jesus, you're a loser. They mock him. You're not what we expected. You're not what we were hoping for. You're not what we want. If you want to be Christ the King, if you want to be Christ our King, you need to meet our expectations. You need to jump through this hoop. You need to perform this task. 
You need to fulfill our demands. You need to be who we want you to be. Well, the sad thing is, is that the things that they brought to Pilate, saying that he was an agitator and that he was, he was trying to overthrow the Roman government, deep down, that's exactly what they wanted. That's exactly why they hated Jesus, because he wasn't doing that. They wanted to be free from Roman oppression and subjugation, and they wanted a strong, mighty king rather than this weak figure that was suffering and dying. And so we, we look at this phrase, the king of the Jews, throughout this chapter as the Lord is being led towards the cross and he's on the cross. We see the world and the church joined in despising the Lord of glory. And we obviously think this is very bad, right? It, this is not a good thing at all. We read this chapter and we're shocked at the way that the world treats our Lord and even more shocked at the way that the, the church and the church leadership is treating our Lord. Well, the, the gospel, brothers and sisters, comes to us this morning. And the Holy Spirit demands from us a response to Christ crucified, Christ the King. And here's the question for me and for you. Is Christ your King? Is that true in your life? Is that true for us as families, as a congregation? Is Christ our King? Don't answer that too quickly. But think about it. You know, it's real easy to shout Hosanna to the King, the Son of David, the Messiah. It's real easy to do that when everybody's doing it. The crowd is going crazy and wild and the whole of Jerusalem is rejoicing and confessing. It's real easy. And they all did it. But five days later, that same crowd... They're all saying, kill him. Kill him. Now, some people say, well, it's not necessarily the same crowd. And that's true. There is a whole bunch of different people in Jerusalem. But later on in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 3, Peter says to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, you crucified the Lord. You did. And we don't read anything about some leftovers from Palm Sunday, some leftover believers saying, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, this is the Messiah here. You, you have to stop. This is not right. Nobody's protesting. Nobody's standing in the way of the Roman soldiers as they lead the Lord Jesus to his place of crucifixion saying, no, you may not pass. You may not kill him. He is our Savior. He is our Lord. He is our King. We will die for him. No one does it. No one. Not even his closest friends, the disciples. No one stands with him. You know, we've experienced it in our own lives, haven't we? You experience it so many different ways. You experience it at school, children. That when everybody's saying something, when everybody's thinking something, when everybody wants to do something, it's really hard to be maybe the only person that says no. That's not right. It's really hard. So either you go along because you don't want to look like a fool, you want to be included, or you just stay quiet. Well, here's the, the problem, brothers and sisters. We are called to make a choice as Christ lays upon us his claim of absolute kingship and sovereignty. There are only two types of people in this world. There are those who are either actively seeking to crucify him or those who stand against the crucifixion. Why are these people actively seeking to crucify him or passively accepting the greatest wickedness and injustice in, history, in the history of the universe? Why are they doing this? Because they're ashamed of him. Because they're afraid of suffering with him and for him. They're afraid of, of pain. They're afraid of the loss of their reputation, the loss of their job, 
the loss of their freedom, the loss of their life. And so they're all quiet. They all play along or they all go quiet. And so the question comes to us. Is Christ your king? Or have we perfected the art of switching between Palm Sunday, Jesus is Lord, and Good Friday, crucify him, depending on where we are and what day of the week it is and who we are with? Is Christ your king? Or do his claims on your life cramp your style? Does he get Does his sovereignty and his sovereign demands upon you get in the way of your plans and your projects? Hebrews chapter 6 speaks about people who chafe under his lordship, who want to live life their own way instead of turning away from sin and embracing Christ. They turn away from Christ and embrace sin. And what does the apostle say in Hebrews chapter 6? If you live that way, if you live holding on to your sin, then you are crucifying once again the Son of God to your own harm and holding him up to contempt. And there is not a lot of hope for you. In fact, there's no hope for you as long as you continue holding on to sin. Someone who calls himself a believer and they say with their mouth, Christ is king. But they have a life which is fruitless and dead and weak and powerless. That life represents that picture there of Jesus on the cross. Glorious title above him, but a weak and powerless figure underneath it. That's exactly what Satan wants for your life. He wants your life to be a constant picture of the humiliation of our Lord, never getting through that to the resurrection of our Lord. These are heavy things, and perhaps you're thinking, well, why did I come to church on a Sunday morning to get assailed from the pulpit with questions about my commitment to Jesus Christ as my king? It's obvious I'm a member of God's church. Shouldn't the preacher assume that he and I are on the good side? We're good people. We love Jesus. We serve Jesus. Brothers and sisters, who is murdering Jesus here in chapter 15 of Mark? It's the people of God. It's the church of God. It's the leaders of the people of God. It's the elders and the deacons and the ministers and the members of the people, the church of God. They are murdering God incarnate. This is the people who on Palm Sunday five days ago, they worshipped him as son of David, as Messiah. And five days later, they are crucifying the Lord of glory. So just having your name, having my name on a membership list of a church doesn't mean to say that we're never going to make the wrong choices, does it? So how can we avoid this? How can we, how can we break out of this cycle of, of Palm Sunday and, and Good Friday, this double life of, of, this, of inconsistency in confession? Because that, that's what we do, isn't it? Every time we choose to sin, what are we doing? Every time we choose to sin and hold on to sin and keep on sinning, we are saying to Jesus, you are not my king. You are not the king of me. I decide. I rule on the throne of my heart and life. Well, how do we break out of that? The answer is not to try real hard to be a better Christian. That never works. We can't. The answer, as always, is to cry, Hosanna, and mean it. If you have your Bible handy, let's just take a quick look at Psalm 118. Psalm 118. And look at verse 25. This is where they get the word Hosanna from. 
We have the translation here in verse 25. The original meaning of the word Hosanna just means save us, Lord. Save us, we pray, Lord. That's, that's the word Hosanna in the Hebrew. Save us, Lord. And over time, it became an exclamation of praise. Save us, Lord. It was an exclamation of joy. But the original meaning is just right there in verse 25. Save us. And so the answer, brothers and sisters, is for us to cry out, Hosanna, save us, and to mean it. Lord Jesus, save me from myself, from my old nature. Change my heart, Lord Jesus. Demolish the idols who claim the throne of my heart. Destroy the arrogance of my sinful nature, which agitates against your lordship and your sovereignty and your kingship. It's only when we ask God to do it, brothers and sisters, that's the only way we can have it. It's only when we ask God to do it that Christ is enthroned in our hearts and our lives. Is Christ your king? It means that he commands and you obey. It means that where he leads you, you follow. It means that what he ordains, you submit to. It means that you deny yourself. It means that you take up your cross. It means that you count everything as loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus your Lord. It means that for his sake, you are ready to suffer the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that you might gain Christ and be found in him, that you might know him and the power of his resurrection and share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. It means that you die to the world and live to God. When we're confronted with Christ the King, then either we say, I must die, or we say, he must die. When we are confronted with Christ's kingship, either we are crucifying Christ over again, or we have been crucified with him. That's the only two options, brothers and sisters. Either You are crucifying the king, or you have been crucified with him. Maybe you're thinking again, brother, pastor, stop it. This is too heavy for a Sunday morning. We're all church members. You should kind of assume that most of us are okay. No. No. I'm not going to do that. Starting with the man in the pulpit, I'm not going to do that. These are hard things because these are hard things that happen that are recorded in the scripture. Palm Sunday, we're all God's people. Good Friday, we're all God's people, including the leadership. And so the gospel comes to us today, brothers and sisters, with a stern warning. The apostle says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith, test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. As we see the way that the world, the church, treated Christ the King. The gospel comes to us this morning, brothers and sisters, with a call to faith. Behold, Christ your King. Behold, Christ crucified. And the response of faith is this. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And for the believer, there is no greater longing and no greater desire than this. It consumes us that Christ would be highly exalted in my life and in the life of everyone I know, and that I and everyone else would know that name which is above every name, and that every knee would bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, starting with me. Now on Palm Sunday... When everybody was worshiping the Lord Jesus, the Pharisees didn't like it. They said, Jesus, tell your disciples to be quiet. Tell them to stop saying this. They're they're being noisy. Let's have a little bit of order and decency here. We're close by the temple. 
And Jesus responded to them, you know, if they keep quiet, the very stones will cry out. If they keep quiet, the very stones will cry out. Can we keep quiet? Can you keep quiet? Jesus is Lord. Christ is King. Does the world have to hear that from Kanye West? Because we're trying to keep that truth for our Palm Sundays, but we don't want to let it interfere too much in real life. Are we ready? Are we ready to assert the claims of Christ the King on every square inch of human life and activity and society? Or are we trying to keep our heads down from Monday to Saturday so we don't get noticed? So do we, we don't get ridiculed by the world along with our Savior. We're going to keep Christ the King and all those beautiful truths for our Sunday services and for our personal devotions and our Bible studies, but have our lips zipped at work and at university and at school. How do we, how do we confess that truth that Christ is King? Do we need a billboard? Do we need to tattoo a cross in our body? Do we need to print t-shirts and hoodies that say Christ is king? Well, you can do all those things, but that's not where it starts. That's not the most powerful way to declare and proclaim that Christ is king. The most powerful way to proclaim the lordship and the sovereign rule of Christ the king is to live in him and from him and unto him and for him, to suffer with him, to suffer for him, to honor him, obey him, submit to him, follow him, worship him, exalt him in every word, in every thought, in every movement of our body. 24-7, 365, in church and out of church, at school, at work, at home, in the community. My life, my words, my thoughts, my attitudes, my choices, my activities. They all proclaim that Christ is king. He is the king of my life. He is the king of my heart, the king of my mind, the king of my body. He is sovereign. Now, Christ the king was crucified in weakness. But the cross has given way to the crown. The king who died in weakness is the king who rose in power the king despised is now the king enthroned. The humiliated king is now revealed as the king of glory. The king who suffered hell and the darkness is now the king in heaven who shines upon us the glorious brightness of his face. And so, brother and sister, come, join the jubilant procession and worship him with shouts of praise. Christ is king. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen.